All right, uh, I guess let's get started. So thank you so much for coming to my talk today. I'm Stephanie Murphy, and today I'm going to be talking about mutual aid for the modern world. And uh, as you'll see, um, I think people have some misconceptions about mutual aid, or maybe they just think about it in sort of a historical sense, right? When you, when you hear about mutual aid, you start thinking of uh, lodge doctors and uh, you know, the fraternal societies and the benefit clubs that people used to have back in 1800s, and uh, sort of how the state uh, systematically eroded those things. But I'm here to tell you today that I think um, we can expand our definition of mutual aid to fit the modern world that we live in today. So I'm going to talk about that. And uh, just some background about me. Uh, I live in New Hampshire, and uh, I moved there for, as a participant in the Free State Project. Um, my activism, I guess, if that's what you want to call it, involves uh, volunteering for free aid, which is actually here providing uh, volunteer first aid for the festival for Libertopia. And we do, uh, we do so for other events, too. And um, I am a graduate student and uh, also a talk radio host. I do a lot of different things, but uh, that's just a little smattering. I'm, so I'm very interested in mutual aid, and that's why I chose to talk about that today. OK, so <laughs> this is some of the things that I hear when I ask people or about mutual aid. This is, <laughs> this is actually a, co a picture of my co-host, uh, Mark Edge, on the show Free Talk Live, which I host on Sunday evenings. And he's sneering at the camera there. Uh, mutual aid, what is that? Is that like mutualism? What are you, some kind of communist? Uh, <laughs> mutual aid, you mean like the Freemasons? What are you, in the Illuminati or something? <laughs> mutual aid, oh yeah, like they used to have back in the 1800s. That's uh, so, sort of an old-timey thing. Nobody does that anymore, right? Well, uh, you know, this talk is, is aimed at showing you why none of these are, are actually true. So what actually is mutual aid? It's basically people helping one another out. And the key is, the key word here is mutual. And uh, mutual aid is different from charity, I think, because charity implies sort of like one person is giving to another with no expectation of re uh, return, I guess, or direct return. Mutual aid is sort of people pooling resources, uh, combining talents and, and stuff like that for everyone's success. So it's sort of aimed at grouping people together and pulling everyone up. Why is it important? Um, I think people who are interested in liberty uh, should take a real interest in mutual aid because it's, it's very important for creating alternatives to some of the services that are provided uh, by the state, whether we want to get, have them or not. Um, stuff like, like health care, like um, uh, child care services, like schools, uh, like insurance, like banking services, financial services. There's all kinds of things, uh, transportation. There are all kinds of things that... Um, you know, people wonder how they would be provided in a society uh, that is stateless. You know, how would we get health care? How would we have uh, transportation? How would people manage their, their lives or their risk, have insurance? Well, you know, mutual aid is a great answer to uh, a lot of those questions. Um, another thing about mutual aid is that it sort of tends to lift people up who are marginalized by society. Um, historically, people who have engaged in mutual aid the most have been um, groups of you know, immigrants, women, other people who maybe didn't have so much social power back in the past, although things are getting better, um, things like mutual aid can still help people be lifted up. Um, increasing people's standard of living, like when we get together and pool our resources, everybody is better off. Um, I think that's a really interesting concept that could apply to anybody, regardless of, of where they stand. We're all better off if we have uh, a little help from our friends, so to speak. And uh, you know, creating community, having a, a network of people. It's sort of a voluntary safety net. And again, an alternative to services that are provided by the state. Um, so when people think of mutual aid historically, these visions of, um, you know, Elks Lodges come up, uh, you know, private hospitals. This is a group of, you know, people sitting around in a, in a, a lodge of some sort, probably belonging to a fraternal organization. And uh, they're you know, engaged in some kind of private club, and they probably had uh, a lodge doctor who would serve people if they needed help. Um, you know, they could pay a little membership fee, and they could go see the doctor, you know, whenever they needed it. Um, and everybody sort of, uh, by pooling their resources together, they could have a doctor on staff full time. Um, other things went on in these clubs, like, like insurance, like uh, banking services. Um, there was schooling, you know, people would get together and, and school their kids. They would 
have one parent do the teaching each day or they'd you know, form little uh, networks, I guess, where they could have, teach their children things. Um, and you know, a lot of these things went on back in the, in the days of yore. Um, <laughs> but mutual aid today, I think, looks, looks a lot different. And when you show people these, these examples and you say, oh, look, this is what they used to do in the past. Um, we could do this again, and we don't need the state to provide health care, roads, what have you. Um, people say, yeah, yeah, but that was in the past. You know, that stuff doesn't occur today. So I want to I see a, a show of hands. Who, uh, who believes that they participate right now in mutual aid in their lives? Okay, so a couple people. Probably I gave away the, uh, the secret of the talk a little early. <laughs> but this is basically the point of what I want to talk about today. If you don't think that you participate in mutual aid right now, you may be surprised to find out that you probably already do. Because I think we can expand our definition of mutual aid, especially to include um, some of the things that go on on the internet, it, which has allowed us to take these services and these clubs and these uh, organizations from local really all the way to global. Um, so yeah, this is basically, I want to show you how, how diverse mutual aid can be and point out some examples. Um, so mutual aid is a process that's driven by the market. Nobody plans it centrally. Nobody controls it. No, there's no bureaucrat sitting up from on high and saying, OK, well, you form this club to do this, and you form this carpool and this daycare to do that. No, nobody does that. So basically what happens is these groups um, evolve spontaneously to serve people's needs. And they, they evolve based on what people need to accomplish. right? So it's, um, it's a very diverse and varied process. In mutual aid now, in the modern world, you, you see um, everything from a very focused scope, like to a local community, maybe people who live in the same place, to people reaching out all over the world, literally, with the internet, to help other people, you know, maybe in, in different countries. Um, in the past, I think the, uh, many of the mutual aid societies were religiously based, or they had uh, a requirement for membership that you be part of a certain religion or a certain ethnic group or, um, or a gender or whatever. Um, nowadays, you see a real diversity. I mean, some, some mutual aid organizations are really completely secular. Some have no requirements for membership, uh, and some have some stringent requirements. Some of them are more top-down. Some of them are completely decentralized. And some of them are really kind of unorganized. Like if you think about a, a, a small family you know, living in a household or something, nobody's really in charge necessarily, or a bunch of roommates or something like that. You think of a carpool, well, nobody's really in charge. Someone different drives every week. So, um, and then some of them are, are a little more hierarchical, like a, like a club, like the, the Elks Club may have officers, or a, a food co-op may have a board of directors. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of diversity in the mutual aid that we see today. I'm just going to start off talking about this. Uh, these are seven cooperative principles. And um, I think probably everybody here is familiar with co-ops, but may not be familiar with these principles, which many co-ops today actually follow as their organizational principles. This came originally from the Rochdale Society of Equitable Pioneers. They were one of these old-timey mutual aid groups in 1840s England. And um, they started you know, what's generally considered to be the first kind of organized cooperatives um, in that era. And they had these principles that they wanted their cooperatives to follow. So um, these have been updated a little bit over the years to reflect more um, modern times. But you know, if you have like a food co-op that you shop at, they probably follow these principles. And they're you know, voluntary and open membership, so nobody has to participate. It's completely voluntary, but anybody can participate. They're not going to discriminate uh, you know, based on arbitrary stuff like race, gender, age, ethnicity, stuff like that. There are motivations and rewards for participating, which means you, know, you get perks for being a member of the co-op because seeing as how it's voluntary, they want to encourage people to join. So maybe if you join a food co-op, you get dividends back or you get um, other perks, or maybe just the benefits of knowing that you're uh, being involved in the community, something like that. They have democratic member control, meaning one member, one vote, and they are owned by the members. So there may be like a board of directors or somebody that kind of steers the organization, but the ownership is the, the shares of the co-op are with the members. So people, some people really like that because it's more direct uh, control. And then they have um, 
democratic control also over the, the capital, you know, like the stuff and, every, and the money that the co-op holds, um, you know, it's controlled by voting from the members. Uh, and they have, you know, some, some limitations on how members can be compensated. It's usually co-ops are structured as, as not for-profit uh, organizations. So uh, the idea is, you know, you can give some rewards back to the uh, patrons, but it's really not the main goal of the business to make a profit. So um, autonomy and independence. Co-ops are independent um, animals, I don't know what, organizations, I guess that's what you call it. But they cooperate with other co-ops. So there's like sort of a network of, of co-ops that link in with each other. And then uh, concern for the community. That's a, a big reason that a lot of people join co-ops, especially things like food co-ops, if they're concerned about sustainable agriculture. That's sort of like in their, in their guiding principles, concern for community. So um, I included a little slide here about, the, about food co-ops and CSAs. How many people have ever been a member of a, of a CSA or shopped at a food co-op? Yeah, very, very common. Um, CSA is, stands for Community Supported Agriculture. I don't know if you can see that. It's a little dark. But um, basically, the, you know, they're member-owned, just like any co-op. Uh, the members will basically support uh, food producers, farmers, and uh, stuff like that at the beginning of, of the growing season. And then they will share um, the risks and benefits of, of producing the food. So you know, if it's a crappy season and they don't get much food, well, they, they don't get much food, but they, you know, they, they, they sort of um, spread that risk over everybody instead of just, just belonging to the farmer. And, if they have a great crop, if they have a bumper crop, you know, then they get extra food at the end of the season. And typically they get, they get a share of the produce every week of whatever's produced. Um, and some of them actually also accept labor in exchange. So you could go like work on a farm and pick veggies and you could get veggies every week as part of your CSA. So those are, um, you know, interesting. A lot of people who are interested in organic food and like food conscious people like to, like to join them. Um, cooperative grocery stores also do the same thing. They follow these cooperative principles. Uh, they're member-owned, not-for-profit. There was a big resurgence in the 1970s of co-op grocery stores, especially for people who wanted like more specialty ingredients or natural and organic foods. Uh, the, there was a huge wave of these coming back, and I think it's still, still pretty much growing. So those are really common examples of, um, I think, mutual aid, just people coming together and, and helping out, and everybody's better off. Um, school co-ops. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so I skipped over this last little point that I had written down on the PowerPoint, which was uh, raw milk raids. Um, this is an example of how uh, government, I think, is still holding back uh, the idea of co-ops and of um, mutual aid in general. Uh, there have been a number of raids on these uh, food co-ops that get products like raw milk, which is actually illegal in some places. And uh, some people really like raw milk. I mean, it's, they say it tastes better, you know, it's better, it's healthier for you. And, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to use the state to stop them from drinking it, but um, there have literally been raids on, uh, on food co-ops and uh, people arrested, food seized, milk, you know, seized and taken away as if it's, you know, a brick of cocaine. <laughs> so uh, a lot of people find that pretty pretty ridiculous. I think the cocaine is ridiculous too. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. Well, plaintiffs' attorneys have web pages on food poisoning and the risk of raw milk. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, that's a great point. So, the, I mean, uh, I, there. Yeah, there are there are risks. I think we should. Um, it's a great thing to mention that there are risks to consuming raw milk and. Um, you know, you can get sick from drinking it, especially pregnant women, they can get listeria, and that's really devastating. But, you know, as long as they're aware of it, you know, they should have the right to make that choice, of course. And life is full of risks. We all make some risky choices. Um, so, you know, raw milk, I think, maybe should be no different than that. But another question? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of benefits, too. I mean, if you want to think about the risks, you should probably also mention benefits of raw milk. And just like with anything, that you're going to start trying new, you know, you don't just sort of down a whole carton of the throng now, right? Like, you sort of, like, you used to a bit wrong. <laughs> so we have some raw milk uh, supporters in the audience. I, I don't know if this microphone will pick up your comments, so I'm just repeating. Yes, it's the, it's the record. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... So preschool co-ops, um, these are actually on the rise. Uh, you may know someone who has participated in one of these. In, in a lot of places, um, it is really hard to find a preschool if you want to send your kid to a preschool. And 
Um, sometimes the government does, you know, like limited preschool in certain areas. Um, in New York City, which is uh, I, where I pulled this graphic from, there was an article in the New York Times called uh, the Pre-K Underground. And it makes it sound like this really dastardly thing, right? But really, it's just parents who, who want to give their child the opportunity to do some pre-kindergarten schooling, but they weren't able to get accepted at any of the kindergarten places, whether it's run by the state or privately. And so what, what did they do? They just got, to got together with other parents, and they organized their own um, pre-K co-ops. And so the way that they're run, I'll let the author of this article tell you about it. Um, she says, in a cooperative pre-K, uh, parents work together to create a school that matches their educational philosophy and worldview. They also run it, finance it, staff it, clean it, and administer it, whatever is necessary to keep costs as low as possible. Uh, often schools operate from members' homes. Some pupils are taught by parents, others by professional teachers. Oh, and in many cases, forming a co-op school is illegal because getting the required permits and passing background checks can be so prohibitively expensive and time-consuming that most simply don't do it. So you can see uh, some of the dilemmas that parents are facing in this situation, and they're turning to mutual aid to get together and, and try to help each other out. And I've, I've looked into the, the sort of pricing for these. Um, you know, they really compare uh, to traditional uh, pre-K and even, even daycare. They can run like 30 bucks a week for tuition, which is really cheap if you think about it, because all these parents are kind of sharing the responsibilities. Um, and you can also have the opportunity, if you want to, you can get together with other parents who, are, who have something else in common, a common bond, as it's often called in mutual aid, something that ties you together, whether it's that you all live in the same city or the same neighborhood, or you all want to feed your kids organic snacks, or you all um, have a certain religion or something like that, or want to teach your kids Chinese or something, you can do it in a, in a daycare co-op. And it, there's a lot more uh, flexibility because it's completely voluntary. Again, it's just people coming together. So um, I find those really interesting. And you know, this happens too on a smaller scale. I've often seen um, parents get together at, at certain workplaces and they'll say, okay, um, this parent is gonna take Monday off, this parent is gonna take Tuesday off, this parent is gonna take Wednesday off and so forth. And then we're all gonna watch each other's kids on the day off. And then they just share it that way and they don't have to pay for uh, costs associated with daycare. They have their friends watch their kids. Um, so I think that's, definitely example of mutual aid. And it's completely voluntary. Okay, so cooperative banking. This is an interesting one. Um, as I was doing research for this talk, I looked up, um, right at the bottom here, it says Occupy Vermont. We're gonna talk about that. But there was actually an instance, um, apparently, where uh, some people from Occupy, the Occupy movement in Vermont took over a credit union. And they could do that. <laughs> they were occupying the credit union. And they still are. I think they, they are still on the board of directors of that credit union. And they're, they're making decisions and changing stuff that they didn't like, um, which is really interesting. And you can do that because a, a credit union, which is actually you know, very popular, a lot of people use them for banking, uh, is, is basically a form of co-op. It's member owned. It's not for profit. It's democratically controlled. Each member, you know, no matter how much money they have in the, in the bank, they have one vote you know, uh, according to how the organization is run and who's on the board of directors. And, uh, you know, they do basically a lot of the same services that major banks do. They issue credit, they have, uh, you know, banking services, and uh, sometimes they give you perks too, like discounts at stores in the community. Um, they, they have this sort of community building aspect to them. Often they'll give loans to um, community development projects, like people uh, wanting to build parks and, you know, public spaces, I guess, for people in the community to use. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, you really can. If you want to take over your local credit union, you, you can do that, um, especially if you're, if you're not happy with how it's run or, or whatever. And this is uh, the back uh, picture here is a little screenshot from the blog of the Vermont Federal Credit Union, which I think actually changed its name after the Occupy Vermont people got in there. Um, and uh, they're basically blogging about uh, the democratic process in peril at Vermont Credit Union. And so, <laughs> you know, you can see their, their influence on what has been going on there. Um, micro lending. This is another interesting example that I really think falls under the category of modern mutual aid. And uh, now this is like maybe a little bit more toward the charity side because there is sort of this dynamic between a lender and a borrower, right? But what it is basically is um, small uh, lenders 
um, who are not like professional lenders by any means, they're just people basically, usually, um, get together and then they give uh, loans, uh, small loans to people, usually in developing countries. And uh, a lot of times the people who are seeking these loans don't really have a reliable credit history or access to banking. So um, they can get loans in this way that they wouldn't otherwise be able to get. And in, in 2006, actually, Mohammed Yunus, who founded Grameen Bank, got the Nobel Prize for this concept of micro-lending. Um, it's a lot of people, there are some critics of micro-lending, but the proponents of micro-lending say um, it alleviates poverty, it helps people, uh, encourages entrepreneurship in the developing world, it encourages people to uh, start their own businesses and kind of get up out of poverty when it might be difficult for them to do so with the services they have access to in their local area. Um, it, it's been criti criticized, I guess, for um, sometimes when people don't, aren't able to pay the loans back. I guess in India there were a lot of like, aggressive lenders and uh, sometimes these micro-lending banks or websites partner with local uh, banks to do the loans. So then there's like a little bit of an intermediary in there. But um, you know, it, it's been criticized because some people say you know, if they can't pay these loans back, sometimes they'll, they'll commit suicide and it's, it's not a good situation. So, you know, I guess like anything, it's, it's not perfect. Some people could criticize, but I think that there, there probably have been a lot of people who have been helped by micro-lending around the world. And there's different types of micro-lending, too. I just listed a bunch of these organizations, and they're all set up uh, slightly differently. Um, Kiva is a really popular micro-lending organization where they basically have a website, and you can give um, you know, a $25 loan, and you can choose who it goes to. It's completely voluntary. And then the, you'll get a notification when they, uh, when they pay it back. And the, the background picture is just a screenshot from Kiva's webpage. So they have like a profile of a person. There's Hector Miguel on the front page. And he wants a loan because he's uh, looking to buy fertilizer for his farm. So um, you could give him a loan if you wanted to. And then Zadisha is, is, a really, is a different, Kiva actually partners with local um, intermediaries like banks to do, the, to do the loan process and convert the currency and so forth. Um, a lot of their, their lenders are giving them US dollars and so they have to convert that to local currency and get it to the person who needs it. So they, they partner with local banks. Um, Zadisha is a, is a more direct like peer-to-peer -peer type of lending. So it kind of takes out that, that intermediary. Um, Vitana does student loans, so they, they allow people to finance student loans in developing countries for people who want to get education. Um, then there's you know, a bunch of other ones. There's Count Me In, that's specifically for women. Um, and micro-lending has been touted as one of these things that really helps, um, especially women in developing countries, start their own businesses and sort of empower them economically. So, and I, the reason I think this is mutual aid, even though it does sort of have this borrower-lender dynamic, is that a bunch of lenders getting together. It's not just one um, big bank that's issuing credit to somebody. It's a bunch of people. And um, also, they get a benefit from it. I mean, they get the benefit of um, knowing that they help somebody else out. Um, even somebody they've never, never met before, except maybe seen a picture of them on the internet, then they get to, they get to help. Um, and maybe they even indirectly reap benefits through the growth of the global economy. Crowdfunding, that's another one. I really do think this is mutual aid, too. And this is what I mean when, we, when I say we can expand our definition to include um, the internet helping with mutual aid. So um, how many people have financed a project on Kickstarter or donated something, you know, a, a documentary they wanted to see made or a product they wanted to see made? It, let me see a show of hands. Yeah, it's, it's very popular. Um, so there are a lot of different um, crowdfunding ways that you can do crowdfunding. Kickstarter is one of the most well-known ones. And I just showed a screenshot from uh, somebody who wanted to basically make a, a new kind of video game console called the Ouya, has an interesting name. <laughs> and uh, they had set a goal of $950,000, but it was so popular that they actually raised um, $8.5 million as of yesterday. So this can be a very effective method of raising funds if you have um, enough promotion and, and if you have um, if you have a, a good idea that people like. So, um, and there have been all kinds of crowdfunded projects, documentaries, films. Um, I see those every day, people trying to get their movies funded on Kickstarter. Um, albums, artists are financed to make albums, startup businesses, tech companies, tech products. Um, even um, there was a girl, a four-year-old girl who had a genetic disease 
who actually, um, her parents set up a crowdfunding thing to sequence her genome because she had a genetic disorder, but they didn't know what the gene was that was causing this disorder. So they, they thought, okay, a good solution would be to sequence her entire genome. And so they, they did it, they got funded, and she was actually saved uh, by this crowdfunded sequencing of her genome. Uh, so, so that's cool. I like crowdfunding as a, as a kind of mutual aid. Um, Self-help and emotional support, these are huge. I mean, this is one of the examples of mutual aid that I think is often really overlooked. People getting together to manage all different kinds of things, whether it's drug addiction, um, you know, weight management, domestic violence, you know, HIV AIDS, uh, parents who, who have special needs for their children. I mean, all of these things are, are so huge. And if you've ever been, been involved or in need of any of these services or involved in these communities, um, you'll see that they're, they're pretty uh, prevalent, you know. And these are all private groups. These are just people getting together, helping each other out. It is genuine mutual aid in the, in the truest sense. Um, so that's another example. And uh, you know, with the internet, I think some of these groups are going on Skype too. You know, like if there's an unusual disease, let's say your child has an unusual genetic disease and you want to find other parents who have the same disease and talk about treatments and so forth, then, you know, you can go on the internet now. You don't have to go to your local uh, hospital and try to find other parents. You can, you can go global. Um, and then, of course, there's the ever popular Neighborhood Watch. Gotten a lot of, uh, I guess, negative attention recently because of the Trayvon Martin situation and George and, you know, it's not... I guess that situation isn't really what Neighborhood Watch were originally about. Um, in the 1960s, there was this lady, Kitty Genovese, who, who was stabbed, and I think she was actually raped, too, in Queens. And uh, there were possibly 38 neighbors who could have helped but didn't. Um, and so this became like a really, pop, uh, a really um, famous example of uh, the bystander effect, right, when people... Uh, know that there's a crime going on, but they think, oh, there's all these other people around who might be able to help, so I, I'm not going to do anything. And, you know, maybe that didn't exactly fit her situation, but regardless, there were a lot of neighborhood watches that organized in response to this. And, you know, a neighborhood watch, I think, can be anything from just people walking their dogs, you know, to, to a more organized and formal thing. Um, and the more neighbors that are around, the more they can kind of look out. And it's really... It's really meant to like deter attacks. It's not meant for people to intervene. I guess that's the original point of neighborhood watches, um, although there was this, this case that people point out with George Zimmerman uh, as an example of sort of vigilante. And then finally, oh, this is not really showing up, but there are some kinds of mutual aid that are you know, basically specific to women. And uh, I looked up, um, I was doing some research for this, and uh, I found some some resources, like if you go to, uh, there's one website that lists all kinds of free clinics for women's health in New York City, and you can network with the, the healthcare providers, you can join the network if you are a provider, um, and it just lists kind of places people can go. Um, of course, intimate partner violence, that's huge um, for people to have a place to go if they want to escape um, a home situation that's not good. And um, transitional housing, if they need a place to stay. Uh, business collectives in the developing world, and and all over the place, really, like there are, there are some challenges, I guess, for women in business, even in the developed world. And so, you know, they can network together and try to uh, find ways to help each other succeed. And then um, I just threw this in here. Um, I was doing some research for this, and I found a DIY gynecology pamphlet, which I thought was interesting. You know, I, this is an example of mutual aid. I don't know if all the advice in there is good. It did say to stick a piece of parsley in your vagina if you want to cure something. Uh, <laughs> So, um, buyer beware, but, um, but it is out there. This, this kind of stuff exists, and, um, you know, I think it, it could help people. Some of the stuff in there is good. And then finally, you know, I think on a small level, stuff like uh, shared housing, and uh, I'm just going to look at the time. Okay, we're, we're, I think we're okay on time so far. On a small level, stuff like, you know, getting a bunch of roommates, if you're in school studying with a study group, uh, sharing textbooks, because they can be so expensive, the textbooks are kind of monopolistic in the way that they're uh, done with intellectual property and stuff. Uh, even carpools, which are really common, neighborhood associations, all of these are, are mutual aid on a, on a small local scale. So this stuff is, is still going on, um, and it's just you kind of have to expand your definition and know where to look for it. And best of all, all these are completely voluntary. 
So I've shown you uh, several different slides of all these ways that people are helping each other out right now in the modern world, even if they don't know each other, even if they're disconnected by, by a lot of distance, they live in different countries, um, they're still able to help each other out. And, uh, and these are all completely voluntary. So um, that's it. This is, um, if you want to hear more of my work, you can uh, check out the free aid booth. We're down there doing um, volunteer first aid for the festival. We're also a networking organization for liberty-loving healthcare professionals. If you want to uh, meet other people who work in the health field, you can network with free aid. And we do uh, CPR education and outreach, which is, I think, you know, if you know CPR and somebody, you're somewhere where somebody needs it, that could be a really uh, great way to help out. I have a podcast called Pork Therapy. It's a, it's a weekly uh, radio show, and then I do bonus content. And then I also am a Sunday night host of the show Free Talk Live, which is a nationally syndicated radio show. And uh, another shameless plug, I recently uh, created an audio book. I narrated and produced an audio book of Markets Not Capitalism. You, you may be hearing about it. I think tomorrow there's a panel on Markets Not Capitalism with uh, some of the authors and the editors of that book. Um, and I have a free audiobook that's available for download if you're interested. And in that book, there are lots of essays about mutual aid and about, um, you know, kind of grassroots people helping each other out. And so you may be interested if you, if you were interested in this talk. And then finally, um, I guess I didn't mention this. I was, I was going to say this at the beginning of the talk, but the term mutual aid, I think, really originated with Peter Kropotkin. He was a, one of those old-timey anarchists, I guess, who wrote, <laughs> who dabbled in biology. And he wrote a book called Mutual Aid, A Factor of Evolution. And uh, it wasn't just about mutual aid as, as I've talked about it, but he was basically arguing that in nature, um, animals are, yes, they're competing with each other for scarce resources for food and stuff like that, but they're also helping one another um, for the benefit of all. You know, there are ways that animals help each other live better, uh, including humans, and, and everybody benefits from a cooperative type of arrangement. So um, he says, in the practice of mutual aid, which we can retrace to the earliest beginnings of evolution, uh, we thus find the positive and undoubted origin of our ethical conceptions, and we can affirm that in the ethical progress of man, mutual support, not mutual struggle, has had the leading part. In its wide extension, even at the present time, we also see a best, the best guarantee of a still loftier evolution of our race. So um, that's it for today's talk, and uh, thank you so much for your attention. Does anybody, does anybody have any questions? Back to the previous slide. Yep. <laughs> Question? Well, one issue around is whether or not people involved in the process are friends or have a face-to-face -face relationship. Mm -hmm. and you might almost divide that, the whole field that way. Because like on the micro lending, that's the problem they got into the original theory was you had a group of women that were part of it and so they were all responsible so they lent to other women they knew and the woman who borrowed knew the women were expecting her to pay back and so forth. Mm. So when it became more like commercial and distant then that bond got lost. So one of the strengths of mutual aid is the personal tie that lost to me. Yeah, so I'm just going to repeat, repeat your comment because I think the microphone will only pick up my voice, but uh, you basically said that it's, you know, one of the original strengths of mutual aid is the face-to-face -face connection and the community building aspect. And sometimes maybe when people are far removed, like they only know each other on the internet, there's less of an incentive to, for instance, pay a loan back or something like that. And um, yeah, I can definitely see that that's true. I think there are, there are also other benefits, though, that come with... Um, maybe some of the more distance types of mutual aid, which is that um, basically you have a wider pool of lenders, you have more people available to help out. So um, yeah, I think both are, are very important. Question? Do you consider an organization where, say, the person doing the organizing, but it's essentially mutual aid like, but somebody's profiting from that? Uh, is there a mutual aid organization that's for profit? Uh, for profit mutual aid, and I, I can think of many examples. One is like a, uh, a sort of a lending pool mm -hmm. where the person who sort of organizes it and sort of makes sure that people pay their payments uh, gets a certain benefit from that. Mm -hmm. Usually there are all people who know each other too, but 
But I see. the person who organizes it because it's, they're, they're in a sense get paid a little bit more than the other people. Mm -hmm. uh, also like a book is the same kind of thing. A, a book what? Oh, a bookie. <laughs> In a sense, that's a mutual way so that people want to place bets on something. But the book, he gets a special benefit, but he also has a special responsibility. Yeah. So, some of them are more a little more hierarchical. You know, like a board of directors for something like a co-op or a neighborhood association might, um, might receive some pay for their services. Um, and as far as being for profit, yeah, I don't really see any conflict with, you know, somebody wanting to make a profit and also uh, aid people in the process. Um, so, and, and some of those examples do, especially things like, uh, you know, the person who sets up Kickstarter, right, they get a cut of every, every funding because they have the opportunity. So, um, but they're also helping people. Yeah. Uh, professional associations obviously fall into this also. Yes, that's an example I didn't include is professional organizations. Yeah. But sometimes they, they have evolved into something other than what they originally were. <laughs> Yeah. So obviously, the initial growth of professional associations was to share knowledge between people. Yeah. So professional organizations, um, you know, can be great for uh, career building, professional development. I think I, I think I may have included um, a little point on there, but I can't forget. Um, I think I forgot whether I put it in there, but. Um, just about people who, who get together to practice um, interviewing uh, skills, job interviews, uh, on-the-job training, continuing medical education, stuff like that. Um, some of these professional organizations, yeah, I think have maybe evolved beyond what they started as because some of them want to get stuff from the government and lobby the government for, for stuff for their profession. but Or to restrict membership. Yeah, it, it can become a guild. But... Um, but yeah, I think that that definitely counts as mutual aid. Um, there's actually a lot of uh, overlap between our talks, uh, which is good. And uh, I guess uh, my focus was a little bit what we could do as libertarians to encourage more public institution building with mutual aid. That's an interesting question. So why, basically, why don't libertarians do more mutual aid and what can we do? Um, wow, great question. Um, I think people who are interested in liberty often tend to be very individualistic and, um, you know, don't necessarily having other people help them out or helping other people out may not be the first thing on their mind. But, um, you know, hopefully with, with people talking about it and people actually doing it, like people putting it into practice, this, you have the Society of Libertarian Entrepreneurs, right, that you're involved with, and then I do free aid, and I think uh, maybe leading by example, and people will see the benefits to being involved in those organizations, whether it's helping them get jobs or helping them learn new things or helping them uh, live healthier lives or whatever, and then they'll they'll naturally want to be involved. That's the thing with a voluntary organization. You, you, it's the perks, I think, will draw people in, but then there are other perks, like helping out. Uh, I'm really glad to hear that all these things are going on. This overlaps a little bit with my talk, too, about walking the walk, not just talking about it. Yeah. Uh, and I do think libertarians need to be more involved in these kind of things. And we need to learn more about them, because this is the kind of thing People don't care about what happened in history in the 19th century. They want to know what's going on right now. And there are all kinds of things going on right now. We need to educate ourselves. And there really isn't a book out there. There are some things. There's a few books that tell you a little bit. And if you're interested, I have a reading list on my table about uh, that, uh, that lists some of the things that are going on right now. If you like, it has one book uh, called How to Be an Everyday Philanthropist. It has Kiva in the Grameen Bank and that kind of stuff. The other book talks about co-ops that are going on right now. So if you want to educate yourself, come get my reading list and it'll have, have those two books. But we need more. We need more people writing about it. I think we need a social service services think tank. But nobody wants to contribute to that. <laughs> People with lots of money just want more economics in their <laughs> and we, But that's not enough. I, 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 
you know, that's fine, but we need more of this kind of stuff. If we want yeah. to incur we we need actual living examples of voluntary services. And I think your talk was great. I'm thrilled. Oh, thank you so much, Sharon. That really means a lot to me. Um, and yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I think I think there is maybe a tendency among libertarians to think of um, social services as being exclusively provided by government and oh icky I don't want to be I don't want to even think about that let's focus on economics and other things but actually these are really needed services and they can be provided on a voluntary basis so yeah why not let's do it and then um, just to repeat uh, so the microphone picks it up um, your books that you have. I know you have a book called What to Do When You Don't Want to Call the Police. Is that your book? or is No, no, that's Joan Kennedy Taylor's book. Joan Kennedy Taylor, yes, okay. Well, I, I do have a practical book. It's called Standing Up to Experts and Authorities. Standing Up to Experts and Authorities, Sharon's book. And, uh, and what were the other ones you mentioned? Um, well, uh, there's, there's one called How to Be an Everyday Philanthropist. Okay, yes, How to Be an Everyday Philanthropist. And there's one on uh, the history of co-ops and, uh, and cooperative uh, movements. I, I don't have the exact title okay. right now, but I have it on the reading list down at my table. Great, and the, and the history of co-ops. Thanks. And another question? Um, yeah, I just think to the whole question of, of why more libertarians aren't involved and how to get them more involved is, I think not, excuse me, not a lot of people recognize that this is actually a tremendous opportunity to show how a free society can work. I mean, yes. And we're actually sort of on the cusp of, you know, in this in this state, the government is failing badly. I mean, there are cutbacks everywhere. People are starting to see, you know, their schools are getting cut back. All just the services that they've been conditioned to believe can only be provided by government, they're starting to lose those. And so this is actually a tremendous opportunity for us to show, to demonstrate in the real world, how it can work without government because people believe it because they've been conditioned, they haven't seen anything else. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a huge opportunity to do to do outreach and you know, people will see it and say, Hey, it's voluntary. Maybe this can work. I like that. Yeah. You may have mentioned time banking. Did you, did you mention time banking? Time, time making? Time banking. Oh time banking. <laughs> I haven't. No, tell me about it. I just joined at Arroyo Seco Time Bank in Los Angeles County. Okay. Uh, it's just a community organization where you, uh, not bartering, but you exchange an hour of services. So you, they have $5 uh. dollars and you can you sign up and they've got a website. But you could actually leverage that into, if you were a libertarian activist and wanted to do some activity, you could actually leverage you know, non-ideological members of your community to help you out with that through time making by exchanging services. There's they want to do, like babysitting or watching your therapy or whatever. Yeah. There's another one in Ithaca called Ithaca Hours. Yes. And their website is IthacaHours.com. And IthacaHours.com. Yeah, that I've heard of Ithaca Hours before, and I just didn't associate the the term time banking with it. But yeah, it's basically um, bartering services essentially, right? And there's kind of a. Well, they have a local currency that's good in it for it for any place that will accept it. Great. And uh, I've just learned it's one of the organizations I just learned about in that book on cooperative movements. So that's on my reading list. So it's really amazing what's going on. It's all being done by the leftists, not being done by libertarians. Yeah. <laughs> They're too busy talking about how Austrian economics will save you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I think that's a good note to end on. And um, next is Teresa Warmke. She is the uh, treasurer at Free Aid. We work together. I'm so pleased to um, have Teresa as a co-organizer and work with her. And uh, she's going to be talking about, uh, well, something sort of similar, uh, but it's more how to empower yourself to make uh, healthcare decisions without uh, trusting the FDA. So thank you so much again. Appreciate your time. Thank you.